Richard Cotton. Welcome to Hashtag Peace Day. <laughs> Jeremy, thanks. <laughs> so, um, Richard, this, this Peace Day, we have been going back and speaking with people who have been instrumental in creating the day, Afghanistan, and, you know, helping institutionalize the day. And, you know, there's all sorts of people who have done profound things that really nobody knew who they were. And in a way, you're one of them. But the difference between you and everybody else is that we've done this work together for the entire 25 years. In mm. fact, 26. Yeah. Because I think probably one of the first people I ever went to to say, look, yeah. I've got a thought about making a film about peace was you. Mm. And, you know, we've, we've had an amazing relationship full of fun and done some pretty mind-blowing things for the last 25 years with Peace One Day and indeed before. So I'd, I'd like to ask you, you know, why have you stuck it out for 25 years? <laughs> Um, well, we, well, I mean, we were just, we were kids, really. You know, we were incredibly young, weren't we? And, you know, for, for you, you know, you kind of, as you say, you came to me and a few other people and you were like, you'd kind of had this epiphany and you were like, I have to create a day of peace and I want to make a film about it. Do you want to help? And I mean, I was just like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, sounds like a good idea. Um, and, you know, I'm not doing anything else. Let's have a go. Like, yeah, sure. Uh, but it became something else quite quickly, didn't it? It became, um, became very involved. I mean, it was really, it was really, a, it was a long, big journey and, 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 and there were really intense moments. But I think to answer your question, why, why have I stayed with it for so long is because fundamentally it's a good idea. And, um, and it's been proved. And I think the idea was also always, wasn't it, to, to create a model, you know, that people could carry forward themselves and to show that it could work, right? I mean, and then, so the, the whole of the later years of Peace One Day, so since, you know, the idea, getting the resolution through, then creating kind of working models of how it might operate in different circumstances, including in, in war zones, was creating a series of models in all these different areas of activity, whether it's, you know, in, in, in war zones or in, you know, the cyber world or in the arts, in dance. I remember there was an amazing, there were several dance uh, projects actually. But I mean, and I just went on and on and on, didn't it? It was just so many, every, every new idea, suddenly there was like, right, how do we, how do we operate within that, within that sphere? So. I think the overwhelming memory for me about the process, apart from it being hard, because it was hard work. I mean, we did long hours and it just it was just a lot. But I think the overwhelming memory and what I've carried forward into all my other work as well are the skills that I've picked up here because the whole ethos was, look, here's, a, here's, a, here's an idea, here's an area of work that we're going to try and develop something in so that the people who operate within that arena have a means to celebrate and mark peace day and so we had to kind of learn about so many different areas of life and work and the community and as a consequence of that we had to throw ourselves into learning different softwares different skills all kinds of different skills and learning new vocabularies about all these different um you know spheres of activity and so it was an incredibly you know it, it was a process of like diving in you know and when we were like but we don't really know anything about this it's like well we've got to find out and the only way to find out is just to jump in and have a go and then we found out that we could learn you know we could learn quite quickly and you know what was from time to time a relatively small team I mean it got quite big for, for a period didn't it and then uh, I, I don't know how big it is now but it's like there were times when we were quite small little clusters of groups you know working on different projects and this room here that was now a studio was full of people different groups of people working on different in education I mean the work we did in education was just like off the chart. I mean, I don't know if you remember, but we printed, well, of course you do. We printed this massive education resource. Before everything was digital, we made this hard copy resource for the 26,000 primary schools in the UK and then another 11 or 12,000 secondary schools in the UK. We printed this thing and I'd never printed it. I'd never overseen the printing of anything in my life, you know. And I remember I made a massive mistake. I don't know if you remember, we printed a whole load and the printers that we used 
completely got it wrong. Uh, and they printed like thousands of these massive education resources and they got it all wrong. And uh, I, had a, I had a good friend who, who looked at the file that we'd given them and he said, no, no, they're using the wrong software. So this is not your fault. And I was like, thank God for that. But it was, you know, there's just, just loads of things where we were just like, for a moment we're out of our depth and then suddenly we kind of, we touch the sand and we go, okay, now we can, we can do this, you know. But it was, there was a lot of that, a lot of that feeling like, I just don't know how to do this, but we've got to do it. So we just get in and do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like that a lot, out of, you know. Yeah, it did. Um, it really, really did. And yeah. you're absolutely right, you know. We, if we didn't know how to do it, we just learned how to do it and we'd get on with it. I mean, in terms of the resolution, so, you know, we did that work and we thought, you know, let's create a dare piece. Um, and then found out that there was a dare piece. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the idea became, OK, well, let's look at what's wrong with that day and then let's see if we can fix it. Do you want to just talk a little bit about that little period? Yeah. So this was a really analogue time and we were writing letters. Obviously, to get a resolution through the United Nations, you have to contact through the General Assembly of the United Nations, which is not bound by international law, but nevertheless it is indicative of world opinion so it's very important um, but we were writing to all the heads of state but not only the heads of state we were writing to the you know the missions in New York for all of the for every country under the United Nations banner and um, it was it, we were writing you know hard copy letters to all of these people but to to presidents and to the, um, the permanent missions in the United Nations in um, mostly in New York and then uh, we were trying to get wider support as well, I remember. We were trying to get support from all of the United Nations agencies as well. That was a really important part of it. So we were writing to the heads of, um, you know, where, whatever, UNICEF or um, <clears throat> all of the agencies. And so uh, there was a lot of hard, co hard copy correspondence. And I remember there were scenes of people on the floor, you know, folding, stuffing envelopes, putting stamps on. You know, not only that, though, not only United Nations and governments, but intergovernmental organisations, non-governmental organisations. We were writing to trades unions. We were writing to educational establishments all over the world. We were writing to, I don't know, I mean, just so many different sectors, yeah, all sectors, sorry. Nobel Peace Laureates, you know. Uh, and um, it, 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 it seemed endless because... You know, the, the, how, many, how many sectors can you break the world down into? And you keep finding new areas to target. And you go, well, of course, that area. I mean, trades unions, for example, they, of course they can mark the day. And in fact, trades unions have the biggest reach of almost anyone, or they did at that time. Trades unions around the world are global trades unions that oversaw the kind of regional trades unions. And you, of course, we didn't know, I didn't know any of this until you start looking at it. And then you can see that actually the world breaks down into, okay, there's a lot of it, but it's relatively, like, in a way felt quite straightforward that if these people were at the heads of these organisations, then surely they would have not only the means, but also the remit to do this, you know. Uh, certainly in terms of heads of state, you know, they were members of the United Nations, and they were part of the General Assembly, and therefore if they adopted the resolution, then they were then, in a sense, bound by their own vote. So, that, that, you know, um, they... The question to them was, what are you now going, thank you, thank you for adopting the resolution. What now can you do to honour the resolution that you've adopted? Please let us know and we will tell the world. And that was the mode, that was the MO for us. Yeah. We, were, we were telling, it was, we were, we were the, the conduit through which any organisation, governmental, United Nations, non-governmental or anything like that, could be, be seen to be, to to have that story told through peace one day and that was you know that's what it felt like it's like we tell us what you're going to do we'll shout about it yeah it's very interesting because um we've had um serena brocklebank today is talking mm -hmm. about uh from the foreign and commonwealth office was talking about the role that she played in you know getting the british government to put the resolution forward and costa rica joining and other co-sponsors and then unanimously being adopted i mean so you've just talked about you know, very interesting that 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 analog process that that way in which we had thousands of pieces of letter letters on the floor uh, we were packaging them up and putting them in a post box in fact the post box is still there just around the corner i look at it most days and think my god you know 25 years ago we were posting to the world and then that led to the resolution going through and other people have been speaking about that today 
And then, of course, you know, you, you know, we've touched on proving it could work in a, in a conflict zone and, and Jude and Ahmed Thousey and Adrian Edwards from Unama in Afghanistan have talked about it working in Afghanistan, the ceasefire holding. Um, there is another element that I'd like to talk about, about, you know, we, you know, to tell, to tell Africa effectively, you know, we decided that we would hold an event in Goma, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, you know, and see if we could, you know, effectively close the international airport in Goma, get, you know, get the agreement from the president uh, and have everybody involved. Monusco, largest peacekeeping force at the time in the world and all parties and take ACON from Los Angeles in. I wonder if you could just share some memories about Goma and, mm -hmm. and, and carrying out that activity. And when you think about that, what flashes before you? What flashes before me in Goma? Um, well, it was risky. That's my overwhelming memory of it is that it was. It felt like a big risk, and uh, it was a. It was a pretty hot conflict zone. Um, it still is, and um, you know, it was a very bold thing to do to close an airport in you know in the middle of a war zone, and. There were no, you know, there were no barriers. We had to create any kind of demarcation between the arena and the outside world. We had to make, we had to create. And also, you know, it's a complex place and there are, there are different stratas of, you know, power. And it's, a, um, it's not something, it's not a, 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 cult, a political culture that I've ever experienced. And so um, I was very nervous about it. You know, and I think that's, that's no surprise. I was I was nervous about it, um, but the you know, I remember clearing the airport. Um, it was my responsibility to get the airport operational by seven a.m. the following morning. So we did this concert on the Sunday, I think, and then the, um, then the airport had to be operational by seven a.m. And because we'd been on the airstrip, or at least part of the concert area had been on the airstrip, we had to clear it and clear it of debris, and we had a team of people prepped to clean it. But um, there was a whole, there was a whole issue with, because we were paying everybody. There was a whole issue with the money that everybody wanted to be paid up front, and then we couldn't, then we couldn't. Um, we we ended up with not as nothing like as many people as we thought we were going to have. So it, was, it became a much much harder operation than we thought it was going to be. Um, you know, it was just, uh, it was just a, str it was strange um, going into. Um, a culture that, that, that just operated completely differently to anything I'd ever experienced. Um, and I suppose it, it felt, the concert itself was also kind of very charged. You know, it was quite tense. We didn't know what was going to happen. There were an awful lot of people there. I mean, some said 40,000. I don't know how many it was. It was, felt like it could have been 40,000 people there. Akon, Jude. I mean, you know, the security operation was just absolutely massive and intense. And, um, you know, I don't know if you remember, there'd been, a, there'd been a concert a few weeks or months before on the other side of the, um, of the continent, um, I think in Senegal or somewhere like that, where there'd been a rush, you know, there'd been a stampede and a few people had been killed. And uh, that was kind of really resonant in my mind. And, I was, uh, you know, I was watching this huge crowd and, you know, it was just very, very hot. And a lot of people, and yeah, it was it was pretty intense. A great <laughs> concert, though. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, in terms of um, you know, Akon, yeah. you know, being on the stage, and then the concert side of it, yeah. um, it was pretty interesting to see it, wasn't it? It was, I mean. Yes, it, it it really did have its risks, a lot of risks, you know. You know, there was a lot. Of, I think there was two and a half thousand soldiers. I mean, it was, it was full of drama and extremely problematic. But in terms of the mission, was to raise awareness of this day uh, across the continent and and beyond. Hundred percent worked, didn't it? You know, I mean, Acom was amazing, and wow, people were holding. I mean, they, you know, he was a superstar. Um, across Africa, but I mean, Goma. I mean, it was just, it was just fantastic. He rolled out on a ball. I don't know if you remember that. And yeah. God, it was an incre incredible moment. <laughs> he rolled out in this in this sphere. But no, I mean, it, it was a great concert, and it kind of spearheaded, or was the kind of 
the kind of mouthpiece for all of the other work that was going on around the concert. So, I mean, there were, there were I don't know how many hundreds of educational uh, um, uh, activities going on around uh, DRC. I mean, it was, it was a lot of cultural stuff, a lot of arts uh, projects, a lot of education projects. Um, community projects and you know in terms of taking the message of Peace Day to that you know really troubled part of the world it absolutely did what we intended it to do and what we needed it to do um, yeah it was it, it was very powerful you know um. so you know so we've talked a little bit about creating the day you know and, and doing all the letters and and you know obviously all of those letters led to the resolution going through ultimately and 21 September is Peace Day, a fixed Canada Day, a day of ceasefire, non-violence, fine. We talked a little bit about Afghanistan and working in a conflict zone and proving it could work. We talked about, you know, institutionalization, you know, of the day. Um, I think, you know, what I guess, I guess that, the, you know, after 25 years of us, you know, working on all of this stuff, as you said, doing concerts, doing social media, doing education, running corporate campaigns, working with all different sectors, you know, putting materials out there across the world to inform three billion people now who are fully aware. I mean, it's been, a, you know, but that's 25 years of hard graft, isn't it, which we've all done and many, many others as well. Um, but the, the end result, you know, the idea that on the 21st September there's behavioural change and a decrease of violence, I mean, that was ultimately what it was all about, right? It's like, what would a massive amount of people who were actually engaged in a peace process, what would be the result of that? And we know the result of that is people behaving differently because they've been involved in a peaceful activity. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about, because I mean, that's, the, that's really the end, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's what we set out to do. Tell a lot of people in the hope that you will see behavioural change, which decreases violence in homes, schools, communities and places of work. And ultimately, we're seeing that on a pretty grand scale now. What would you say about that? Well, I mean, you've said, you've said it, uh, really. I mean, that, that is the whole point, isn't it, is to provide a, a, a platform for people to take this on themselves in whatever way that they see fit. And um, the idea of a universal, simultaneous cessation of hostilities, whether that be in the conflict zone or in a domestic environment, because we know that domestic abuse is the biggest cause, right? It's the biggest killer in, on earth, isn't it? And, um, you know, that, that for me, uh, to have a moment, a pause, the idea that we can all stop together, irrespective of our beliefs around, you know, culture, religion, whatever it might, politics, to put all of that aside and to acknowledge our shared humanity is really the highest calling that we can have, really, is to um, experience peace together. And that's what peace one day set out to do and continues to prove on a daily basis. I also think, I really want to say as well, that um, the whole purpose of this and the reason why I've been supportive for so long is because the whole, we want to communicate to people that the day only exists, it's only functional if people get involved, right? Otherwise it's just an abstract concept. And it, it, it's a practical day that, that people can embrace in whatever sphere of life they operate, whether it's in business or in education or in trades unions or in politics or the arts or science. If you're part of any kind of organisation, whether it's a school or a business or a government or a governmental department or United Nations or whatever, this day can be embraced by you and by your constituency, whatever that might be. And really, that's the only thing that validates it. So, you know, we, we can shout about the day and we can say what a great idea it is, but people need to do something on the day in order for it to be truly working. And so, I, you know, I, I just want to take this opportunity to encourage everybody to get involved, really, because that's what it's all about. And, you know, the bigger this day can become, the more activity there is on this day, the greater chance we have of showing that humanity has 
a chance. Yeah, very interesting. I was just thinking there's, um, and it, I feel, very privileged and I mean incredibly lucky there's I mean because you know, there are two people I mean listen we, we, we made films before Peace One Day I mean you make films you're an amazing actor do unbelievable voiceovers you, you you know you're out there being highly creative in other ways as well uh, but there are two people well, as I said you and I have made films together for a long time even before Peace One Day but there are two people who have been present in today's broadcast who have been there for the entire 25 years and both of those people I, I actually love you know, like brothers, you know, and I just want to thank you, Richard, for standing by me, you know, looking after me in so many different ways, you know, because Peace One Day wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for you. You know, you are the one person who has just been there forever, always, and it's amazing. I'm so pleased I know you, man. It's been a privilege. Yeah, man. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> cool, dude. Nice, man. Nice. Yeah. All right.